the I forgot to get my end of the world coffee mug. This will do. Pretend there is writing on the mug that says end of the world coffee. A little water slip there. Sip, I should say. And hey, my name's Aaron from God a Minute. We are expecting the rapture of the church any minute, really. And uh, we're just looking at prophecy and um, and studying things. I've been doing this for about four years. And so we have something kind of cool here that was brought to me by Tracy. So I've got uh, a, a picture from a video to share. I might read an article. Um, I have a bunch of notes. I've got a couple scrambly notes all over the place. So it's going to be a bit of a focused video, but it's going to be a little bit of a spaghetti video as well with my thoughts. And if you got any questions, I'll just let you guys uh, ask questions and you know, we'll bounce around a bit. So um, where do we begin? I, well, I titled this, pro this, this video about the prophecy of uh, Elam, Iran. So maybe we should start where, where I titled it before I go with that. You need to get saved. You need to be in relationship with Jesus. You need to accept the free gift of salvation on the cross. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I say go, Jesus, go, because we are we're like going to be cheering him on, you know, behind him. And uh, at the second coming, saying, go, Jesus, go. Finish what you started here. Become the prince of Jerusalem. Be the prince of peace. And when we pray for Jerusalem, we're praying for the for the peace of Jerusalem, for the prince, the the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come back, and um, and of course we expect the rapture uh, seven years before that all happens. And so here we are, we're in 2024, and I've done timelines over the years, and we're we're going back and forth, and we're studying, and every year we do this, we get better and better and better at it. And and before I talk about anything, everything is conjecture, everything is speculation, and everything is study that I study, and I'm just sharing with with what I study. Uh, I don't know everything, and uh, so I'm going to throw some thoughts your way as well in this video with, with some concepts. So let's start off with the prophecy. In Jeremiah 49, verse 35, more or less, there's a prophecy against Elam, and this is what I should do. I should I should show you the picture of, of what I have here. So we've got, this is, here I'll hide my face for a second so it's bigger. And we'll go here, and this is a picture. This is from uh, a video. It's called the channel was called Prophecy Watchers, and this video was nine years ago. Again, Tracy sent this to me, and this video is called Bill Solace Nuclear Showdown in Iran. And in this half-hour video, you can check it out. There's this picture that really caught my eye, and he's talking about there's a nuclear plant in Iran. This picture is a little bit cut off, but this is Iran, and he he explains that Elam is part of Iran. Now in Iran, there is a massive nuclear plant right on this coast here, and it's the Bushier nuclear plant. And um, so you got that picture nice in your mind here. And we all know that if a nuclear plant was to blow up, that would be bad news. Well, uh, later on in this video here, which I, I'll have to link in this video, I'll have to link this actual video later on in my description box, I'll do that. But he explains that this nuclear plant in Elam was built on a fault line so that's bad news and apparently there was a 6.8 earthquake in that area um about 10 years ago nine years ago 37 people were killed and so i thought that was really interesting that they would build a nuclear plant on a fault line and this is where um, old elam was and so there was a prophecy against elam and so the first question everybody should always ask is was this prophecy already fulfilled or is this a future fulfillment what's going on with that so um what we have what i found here is the there's a word called an h strong it's here i'll show this now the strong's number is h319 and let me go over to my app now and h319 oh here's the bow by the way when it says the bow yeah we'll get into that h319 and that means the end. So there is latter right there. You see the word latter? Here, I'll, I'll highlight it. You know what? I will find the actual verse. I'll do that, actually. I'll just go to Jeremiah. Um, it's right here. It's highlighted on the screen. I'll make it bigger if it's... That is the biggest. Okay, so if you go down to the very bottom, you'll see the word latter. 
And if you highlight that word, that's H319, and then that's Akareth. And that means the end, okay? So there's about 60 verses that have that Hebrew word Akareth. The value of Akareth is about 619. You have an you have an Aleph, a Het, a Chet, a Resh, a, a Yod, and a Tav. Akareth. And uh, this is the end. And when Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end, he he might have said, I am the, uh, well, let me get the Hebrew here. He might have said, I am the re Reshith and the Akareth. I am the Reshith and the Ar Akareth. Akareth is the end. A Reshith would be the beginning. I'm the beginning and the end. The Reshith and the Akareth. So um, this right here is Akareth, but then the next word beside it would be days, yam, and that's the Hebrew word for yam. So Akareth yam. The interesting thing about this is, I'll say this kind of slow so that you this really registers, is there's not too many areas in the Old Testament when it says latter days. Or in other words, there's not too many verses in the Old Testament where it uses the combination of these two words, which is Akareth yam. And usually when it uses those two Hebrew words together, Akareth yam, it's talking about the latter days, or in other words, the end times. It seems like all every time that it uses those two Hebrew words, it's talking about end time stuff, like seven year tribulation, or, or the second coming, or the rapture, or, or the millennial kingdom. Like it's talking about way in the future. You know, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah was written uh, right around the six, six, you know, seven or six hundred BC in, in in that time frame. You know, and so, but it's when it's talking about the Akareth Yom, it's talking about future, future, future events in most cases. Okay, so this particular phrase is in the Elam prophecy, which seems to be a future prophecy, and so here it is: judgment on Elam. Okay, so the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet. Okay, I, sh I should just pause. Everybody that's viewing this video, I'm sure most people viewing this video know by now that Iran sent some some drones over to Israel, and there might be a response soon and all that. So I'm um, just assuming you guys are caught up on the world news. So this is why we're looking at this too, right? So we have here Jeremiah 49, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam. And so Elam is another way of saying Iran, the chief of their might. And upon Elam, or Iran, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them towards all those winds. And there shall be no nation whether the outcasts of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life, and I will bring evil upon them. My fierce anger, saith the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy uh, from thence the king and the princes, saith the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. Okay, so over here it says bows. Now, um, if you remember my video I did, you probably, probably don't remember because I could hardly remember it, but I did this video about two or three years ago explaining how Zechariah 5 is very clearly a picture of bombs. It's not a, a, a magical scroll flying in the sky. It's just with the translation of the Hebrew... Uh, Back then, you know, Zechariah wouldn't have known how to describe a bomb. So I think he described it in such a way that he's like, oh, it looks like a flying scroll in the air, but really it was like a bomb. So again, Jeremiah wouldn't have been able to say, okay, there's going to be a nuclear plant and there's going to be bombs and tanks and drones. So the best way to describe that is use the word bow. And so it's it's a pretty reasonable um, guess to say that I will break the bow of Elon means I will... Um, I will limit them from having the capability of sending bombs. Right? So that word bow there. And Elam, Jer Jeremiah 49, verse 35, that bow probably means some sort of a current military uh, change in power. And so we see that this is likely a future prophecy also because, like I said before, it shall come to pass in the uh, Akarith, Yam. Usually when those two words are together, it's, a, it's an end times prophecy. I went through the Bible this afternoon, and I saw that really there's only about 10 times when you see these two Hebrew words together. Sometimes you'll see the word latter, but it's related to maybe the age of a person or something. Um, 
it's only about 10 times and it's in all those prophetic books like Daniel and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And uh, so we might get into that. I'm not quite sure if we're going to get into that here. Uh, we'll see if we have time at the end. But so what we have here is what looks to be a clear uh, prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49. And of course, if you're familiar with the end of Jeremiah, it's really a prophecy against uh, Babylon as well. Um, it's 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 a prophecy against so many places in that area, and it's just riddled with in the end or the latter days. Um, so we have on the screen. Okay, so we have um we have what looks to be a prophecy or um, a future event that's going to happen on Elam, Iran. In Jeremiah 49, and we had this nuclear plant, and it's on a fault line, and uh, it's almost like building. They built a nuclear plant on the new Madrid fault line. Like you know how it's so bad if if it was to be an earthquake. If there was to be, I would. It looks to be like if it was there. If there was to be a severe earthquake, the nuclear plant would blow up, and all of Iran would be just decimated, and they would be dispersed. They would have to leave the country, which would fulfill that that prophecy in Jeremiah 49. So that's very, very interesting, given the time that we're in right now, like right now, as uh, Israel is going to, we're going to see how they're going to respond and all that. Um, so very interesting times. Um, I will say, what as you were watching war things and war development, just be careful with, some people, they just like to make content out of nothing. So just use your discernment. Some people, they just like to report on every single every single solitary movement of everybody. Don't get, just be careful not to get sucked into the, like, the craziness of it to be, just know enough to know enough with them when it comes to all that, okay? Um, more, more importantly than anything else, be reading your Bible and... Um, more than anything else. If you're watching five hours of, of uh, CNN and you're reading five minutes of Bible a week, you got, you, you know, you got to reverse that, <laughs> okay? Um, but anyway, what an interesting time we're in. We are um, looking at uh, Iran and, and Israel and this Jeremiah 49 thing to be fulfilled, and it looks like it's happening in and around this time. Uh, I'll read one more of this Latter-day stuff, just so you can paint a picture of what I'm trying to say here. Latter days, um, Akareth Yom, uh, uh, yeah, Ak, Akareth. I think you do got to do that. <laughs> Wait, because it's got a chet in, in the middle of it. Akareth. I'll, I'll learn Hebrew, I guess, in the clouds. I don't know. I'll get better up there. But okay, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. This is another place, one of the other 10 places that it's in the Bible. And it says, The word of that Isaiah, the son of uh, Emma saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, in the Akareth Yom. Akareth Yom. In the latter days. Okay, now when these two words are together, there's something extra special here. What is it going to say now after these two Hebrew words? Akareth Yom, 319. And that Hebrew word for, for uh, days would be H3117. And what does it say here in Isaiah chapter 2? That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against the nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. And so this is a pretty clear description of when the Messiah comes. And, and he rules during the Millennial Kingdom. But that was all um, before it was talking about the Millennial Kingdom and the Messiah coming. It said in the latter days, in the Akhareth Yom. Okay? I'm repeating myself because I know I'm a human and I have a bad memory, and sometimes you got to say it like 12 times for, for people to actually understand what you're saying. So, 
in the latter days, talking about when Jesus comes back and he does his millennial uh, kingdom, he rules and reigns. And so we have that, that same verbiage in Jeremiah 49, when it seems that Iran will be taken out by the hand of the Lord. Okay. All right. So we're going to come back probably to these notes. I got about, uh, you know, eight other verses to share with that theme, but I want to share something else um, before I forget. And so I, if you guys have been following my channel for a while, um, I've got kind of two scenarios where the, the tribulation can play out. And my favorite, uh, my favorite feast for a rapture would be Passover, and my favorite midpoint uh, for the tribulation would be Hanukkah. That's that's scenario number one. It's been like that for about two years. Scenario number two would be just to bounce bounce everything over six months. So um, tribulation starting in the fall and a midpoint around Passover. That's another scenario as well that I that I. I like a lot too. So I like those two scenarios quite a bit in terms of a blueprint for, for a tribulation. So Hanukkah, let's look at scenario one now. With a spring or a summer rapture, not looking at it, right? This video isn't right, right about a day right now in terms of a rapture, just like right now. Anytime between Passover and Pentecost, you know, anytime between April, May, June, July, that, that, that kind of time frame. Love it. My favorite's Passover. Second Passover is exciting. Ascension Day is exciting. Pentecost, like, it's all exciting. But I want to look at Hanukkah as a midpoint right now, okay? Here's the cool thing about Hanukkah. I like this a lot. All right, so let's show my screen, and we'll talk about Hanukkah. If Hanukkah, if the halfway point is going to be 2027, when will Hanukkah be, and what? why do we care? So I'm going to show you on the screen here, so in 2027, generally speaking, I, I always prefer to count the year after the spring equinox. So first I'm going to show you what they did, what the Torah calendar did in 2027. Here's the spring equinox, but they, they started their new moon at the beginning of 2027. Uh, before the spring equinox, which means they, they started the month too early in my perspective. So with that being said, this is the last month and the ne and the month bumps back. So that means that Hanukkah would fall on Christmas uh, as we know it. Okay, because right now on their calendar they got it as November 25th, right here, November 25th. But what you gotta do is you gotta bump that back a month because in my opinion, they're a, a month early. So what that means is this. It means that Hanukkah, if Hanukkah is in fact midpoint, that means the day that they they so what happened is okay, let me let me back up for the people that don't know what Hanukkah is. On Kislev fifteen, the ninth month, fifteenth day, he set up an abomination of desolation. He uh, he set up a statue. He had this is Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, and he he came in, took over the temple after a couple of years, and he he had the Jews um, worship a statue. Ten days later, he sacrificed a pig on the altar. So that's the twenty fifth day of Kislev. So the twenty fifth day of Kislev is really the ultimate abomination uh, of desolation, where he put up a pig on the altar and sacrificed it to the Zeus god and. He wanted the Jews to to worship the Greek gods and, and himself, and the Jews said, "No, no, no, we're not doing that." So they so they stabbed uh, the high priest and they ran off to the wilderness for three years and they came back on Hanukkah. So, in my opinion, Hanukkah time frame for a midpoint is always fantastic. Well, that right here is on Christmas. So here's a really awesome thing about this: is you can see the winter solstice there, right? So this this does this does like three things. It qualifies three things for the midpoint. It, it's kind of a really exciting thing here. Okay, so you can see the winter solstice on December twenty third. So we can say point number one, it's winter. Point number two, it's Hanukkah, and point number three, it's on a Sabbath. It's on a Saturday. Okay, it's on a Friday night Saturday. 
So it accomplishes three goals. I'm going to say that again. It's at, it's in winter, it's Hanukkah, and it's on a Sabbath. It's winter, it's Hanukkah, it's on a Sabbath. It's when Antiochus Epiphanes set up his abomination of desolation. It's in winter, it's Hanukkah, and it's on a Sabbath. Okay. All right, so let's do this now. Let's, let's, uh, I guess you don't need my face. We'll just do this. It, I said it was winter, it was Hanukkah, and it was a Sabbath. Okay. Winter, Hanukkah, Sabbath. Winter, Hanukkah, Sabbath. Winter, Hanukkah, Sabbath. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 15. We'll read a few verses here. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whose readeth, let him understand. Then let him which is in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight not be in winter check mark or on the sabbath check mark abomination of desolation hanukkah so jesus is talking about the uh, abomination of desolation the abomination of desolation is when a man will stand in a temple and say hey i'm god worship me that's the abomination of desolation Jesus was speaking to an audience who know, knew 200 years ago that this is exactly what happened because Antiochus Epiphanes IV set up the abomination of desolation about 200 years before Christ was talking about this. So they all knew what was going on. They all knew what was going on. Like, okay, there's going to be a guy that's going to come in. He's going to destroy the temple. He's going to make us worship the Greek gods. We got it. Okay, okay. And then the hint. The hint is pray that it's not in winter and pray that it's not on a Sabbath. So he's talking about the midway. He's talking about the halfway point here. He's talking about the abomination of desolation. Okay? So that Torah calendar qualifies Matthew 24 to a T. It qualifies it to a T. The Torah calendar for 2028 isn't that great in terms of uh, the qualifications for, for what I'm saying. So we'll do this. I'll show you again. Keep in mind, this is a month off, right? So this right here would be after the winter solstice, and it would be on the Sabbath, and it would be the day that it, they set the pig up for the abomination of desolation. So isn't that super cool? So the the 2028. When does this? When does it all land? When does the ninth of Kislev? And I'm almost positive that 2028 their calendar is correct. In Hanukkah. Yeah, it would be, because here it is. So Hanukkah in 2028 would be on December 15th. And then, oh yeah, it's after Christmas. Uh, yeah, oh, wait a second. It is, see, I didn't double check. It's, uh, okay, so the 25th would be, I guess, in January. So it just, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't fit as good. Let's see what, what we're going to do here. Uh... Is that the end of it, or is this it? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Anyway, it doesn't fit as good. <laughs> okay, there it is. Hanukkah, day six, day seven, day eight. Let me go back. Let me go back. Let me just make sure. It doesn't fit as nice. That's the whole point, but let me just make sure I know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so, oh. The tw the, is this Kislev? This is the ninth month. 15th okay there is the 15th therefore that's the 25th of kislov okay so there you go the 25th of kislov in uh 2028 is before the winter solstice there it is right here it's before the winter solstice so that doesn't fit it's not on a sabbath that doesn't fit uh before the winter solstice and it's not on a sabbath so it only qualify it only has one out of three qualifications so the 2027 midpoint if that's in fact the midpoint, which is my favorite scenario, here's 2027, uh, and there, there is a, there it is, Sabbath Friday night, 
it it, qual- it has three to three qualifications. It's got a, after the winter solstice, and it's got um, mid- mid- midpoint on a Sabbath, and it's a, it's a Hanukkah. It's a abomination of desolation. So that's awesome. Okay, so that's that's so cool. So here we go. So so that's that. All right. So we've got the abomination of desolation conversation that I wanted to bring up. Oh yeah. Okay. Since we're on the the subject of abomination of desolation, this is where I'm going to speculate, folks. Don't shoot the guy that's just throwing ideas at you. So have mercy on your brother Aram. I'm not a prophet. I'm not going saying stuff. I don't get any dreams. I don't eat cheeseburgers and then all of a sudden I know stuff. No, no, no. I'm just guessing and studying. <clears throat> okay, so um Everybody was pretty depressed about this whole fig tree generation. Some people are still hanging on with this fig tree generation. I propose an idea that I just thought about today. In five minutes, we might say it's horrible. We might, but in five minutes, we might go, "Oh, wait a second, yeah, maybe, maybe." Okay, all right. So we just read the play uh, that your flight may not be in winter. But wait a second, that word "flight." Pray that your flight may not be in winter okay your flight okay your flight that's kind of neat your flight okay so i'll pull up the bible and we'll bring the bible up there and here is the word flight play that your flight may not be in winter all right we all are familiar if you've been watching end time stuff for a while uh psalm 90 verse 10 what does it say and again, play at your flight. We're talking about the mid- midpoint here. We're talking about the midpoint. Now, I believe the rapture is before the tribulation, but right now we're talking about the midpoint. And, it, and the midpoint had the word flight uh, in it. Well, what does Psalm 90 verse 10 say? The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, which is 80, so 70 or 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away oh okay so we fly away who flies away who what where when how who was on first what was on second when was on third you know what i'm saying okay so in psalm 90 verse 10 it's talking about flying away it's talking about flying away in psalm 90 verse 10 in matthew 24 it's talking about Play your, play your flight. It may not be in winter. Okay, you know, okay, that's interesting, Aaron. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I threw it to Christy. Like, what do you think? She's like, ah, she, well, it reminds me of Revelation 12. I'm like, oh, yeah, what? We're in Revelation 12. She goes, Revelation 12, 14. At the midpoint. Okay, tell me more. Well, Revelation 12, verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly, fly into the wilderness. Oh. And that's at the halfway point. Into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. From the face of the serpent. Okay, so we got a flight in Revelation 12, verse 14, given to the women to be brought to the wilderness with a flight. It also says in Matthew 24, Specifically, verse uh, 20, pray that your flight not be in winter, on the Sabbath day, maybe at um, Hanukkah, the day of abomination of desolation. And Psalm 90, verse 10, like I just said, but we, and you'll, it'll soon be cut off and we fly away after the 80 years. Now, uh, 1948 plus 80 years, It a, a halfway point at 2027 will fit within that concept. So it's just, I propose, I propose, like certainly test what I'm saying, and what do you think? Do you think that we can apply the fig tree generation of 80 years to the midway point? We have a flight in Psalm 90 verse 10. We got a flight in 24, Matthew 24, talking about the halfway point. We got a flight in Revelation 12, verse 14. She's given wings like an eagle to fly. 
I'll leave that with you. And of course, Israel at that point, at the halfway point, they would be out of their nation. They would kind of be destroyed. It would be sort of the end of them as a, as a nation uh, temporarily at that moment in time, wouldn't it? You know? So that's my proposal to you. What do you think about applying the fig tree generation to the halfway point? Because of Matthew 24... I'll say I'll say the verses again because I I forget it and if I can't remember what I'm saying you you can't remember it. Matthew 24 verse 20 and pray that your flight may not be in winter your flight Psalm 90 verse 10 your flight Revelation 12 verse 14 the woman will be given wings to fly away at the halfway point I certainly can make the connection in my mind that it could that we uh, I I can see it but we'll see we'll see we'll see. We'll see how this goes. I leave that with you. Maybe I'll we'll chew on that a bit more. Okay, so there's that. We've got the potential halfway point at Hanukkah in 2027, minus 1260. I don't know what day that gets you. That gets you somewhere in the summer of this year. I hope the rapture happens before then. You know that kind of thing. Um, the prophecy of Elam. We talked about that at the beginning of the video. Was there anything else? You know what? How about I? Um, how about I read that article now that I was going to read, so I can do this now, and we'll make we'll do that and we'll do this. So this was the destruction of Iran again, sent me to be right by Tracy, written by it looks like Joel, and this website's ChristianEvidence.net, and I do not agree with the first paragraph, but other than that, it was a really cool overview of what Bill Sellis was saying. Uh, he says here in the first paragraph, there is another prophecy concerning Iran that possibly precedes the Gog and Magog scenario outlined by Ezekiel. In Jeremiah 49, uh, 34 for 39, we are told that Elam will come under the judgment of God for conspiring to launch an attack against Israel. Okay, so this phrase right here, that's not in the Bible. Um, God is not going to bring judgment because they launched an attack on Israel. But other than that, this article is really cool. So I'm going to continue reading on. In the latter days, modern-day Iraq, or modern-day Iran, sorry, is comprised of ancient Elam, I showed you that picture earlier, and Pitt and Persia. This prophecy concerning Iran has not yet been fulfilled, but seems to align with Iran's current nuclear aspirations. Uh, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam. Talked about that, how a bow uh, probably means military uh, as we know it. The chief of their might. Jeremiah predicts that Elam will be struck at the foremost place of its strength. Today, this could infer an attack upon Iran's growing nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushir nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. See map on the right. And this is a pretty small thing right here. But like I showed you, the nuclear plant is right there. Here, I'll show you this picture again. Just so you guys can see it again. There's a nuclear plant right there. And again, bump this picture over here. Show it one more time. And uh, what minute mark was it? Right here. Uh, where if there was a massive earthquake there, it would be really catastrophic, and people would have to vacate that area, and it would be a horrible thing. But it would fit prophecy perfect if this happened. So anyway, we'll go back to the article here. Um, Jeremiah also predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow when you. Your bow is broken. You cannot load the arrows from out of your quiver or, in a modern sense, the missiles out of your silo. This might imply that IRGC, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, will be unable to launch scores of its missiles. Uh, Jeremiah then warns that after the attack, the affected populations are forced to scatter from the area. This could be the result of Iranians attempting to flee from an isolated nuclear disaster. Should the Bushir nuclear reactor be struck, this becomes a very real possibility because the facility is loaded with Russian-supplied fuel rods. John Bolton, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., said in 2010, Israel's got a problem because once the fuel rods are inserted into the reactor, an attack would almost certainly release the radiation into the atmosphere. Several other studies conducted for the safety of um, Bushier nuclear site have concluded that an accident at the facility could result in such a disaster. The radioactive mess would cause a mass exodus of peoples in the surrounding area, a worldwide uh, dispersion of the Iranian people, just as prophesied. 
For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life, and I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. From the scripture we can derive, the Lord is angry with Iran, which results in some disaster in Iran. And I will set my throne on Elam and destroy from thence the king and princes, saith the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days. So there is that little phrase, latter days. That's those two Hebrew words, akarath yom. Uh, that's usually talking about end times events. That I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. Jeremiah's prophecy also points out the Lord will set his throne in Elam. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of this historic homeland in Elam. Interestingly, for the last few years, Iran has been experiencing one of the largest revivals on earth. This is a really cool thing too. From approximately 500 believers in 1979, the year of the Iranian Revolution, to several million today, Iran is the fastest growing evangelical population in the world. Christianity uh, is, I don't know how to say this word, uh, but joining so rapidly that the rogue Islamic regime has instituted harsh policies to curb its growth. The most likely fulfillment of this prophecy will occur when the nuclear reactor is destroyed. Really interesting. Either by the Israelis or by an earthquake. My vote would be earthquake, but um, we'll keep on reading. Releasing radiation that will force the evacuation of the whole area. Take note that the region where Bushir is located in Elam is active earthquake country, and it sits on a tectonic plate. The Bushnir nuclear power plant is physically separated from the greater Iran, Persia, by the Zagros mountain range. The rapid elevation change due to the Zagros mountain range would likely protect most of Iran from the meltdown, allowing them to attack as one of the nations of Magog another day. Interestingly, Ezekiel was familiar with Elam, according to Ezekiel 32, but he did not include Elam in the lineup of invaders in Ezekiel 38, perhaps because it is destroyed by them. Okay, so um, written more than 2,600 years ago, Jeremiah may have predicted the fate of Iran's nuclear program and today's spiritual showdown in Iran. What are the odds of that? Okay, so I'll try to make sure to post this in my description box later. Uh, that was ChristianEvidence.net, and the other video, again, was um, Prophecy Watchers, Bill Solace. And, um, and so that's that. Okay, so talked about the halfway point, talked about this prophecy, and we have some other things. Uh, as an example, Micah 4, verse 1. Here's another example of when you see the word latter days, or akarith yam, it's pretty neat how you can see it's talking about, um, you know, end, end time stuff. So it says, but in the last days, here is the Yom, right here. Oh, no, that's Akarith. Akarith, I think you got to go. Akarith, oh man. Akarith, Yom. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. So here's another area where it's just simply talking that it's like millennial kingdom talk. But it's these two Hebrew words together that really set it up. It's really, usually when these, these you see these two words, it's, it's like a really fantastic combination of end times events. Okay. Okay. So Hosea 3 verse 5. I will say too that I was really excited. I but I, then I had to go correct myself. I, I counted the Hebrew letters of Akarath and Yom, and it almost equals 666. It was so close with the with the value of the Hebrew letters. But then I recounted. I'm like, oh, darn it. It's 675. I thought I had something really neat. So it was kind of a, oh, man. So much for correcting yourself. But anyway, Hosea 3 verse 5 is another area where this is really an interesting prophecy here. Uh, it says, right in the middle of nowhere, kind of, it says, Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So this 
verbiage right here, latter days, is they're not talking about David, the real David. They're talking about David as in the Messiah, the son of David, is really what they're what this Bible verse is talking about. So this just brings more weight to the fact that when you see the word latter and days together, when you see the akareth, and this is H319, and you see the, the Strong's H3117, yam, you're usually talking about, you know, the second coming or the rapture or the millennial kingdom. You're, we're talking about prophetic events yet to come. That's usually the pattern that I'm seeing um, in in the Bible when it says that those kinds of things. And I'll show you another area too that's that's really fun. And um, let's see here. Let's go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 is the other time when we see the latter days. And it's, uh, or is it, is it 1014 or is it 10? Latter days, here it is. So latter days. So there was a vision in chapter 10. There's a whole lot of uh, end time stuff being spoken about in the whole chapter of Daniel chapter 10. The prince of the kingdom of Persia and 21 days and all this stuff. Uh, another area where it's talking about prophetic events. Ezekiel 38 is the other spot where I have found latter days in combination with each other. And you guys, most people watching this video are really familiar with Ezekiel 38. Well, here's the extra, the double fun thing. Okay, so get your uh, concentration on here. This is a, a fun thing. So, Ezekiel 38, verse 8. In many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Okay, so this is a different word. This is years, not not days. So it's, but it's saying latter years. So not the same, but still a prophetic tone to this. Latter years, not latter days. This word in Hebrew is uh, shana, shana. And it's talking about latter years. Well, but this, in my opinion, is when it's talking about Israel coming back as a nation. Let me read it. In many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Later on in this chapter, though, it uses that phrase. It goes back to using those two Hebrew uh, words together. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days, the Akareth Yom. And now this is talking about the events yet to come. And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in the Ogog before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in of old time? by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days. Yeah, so that's really cool. Every time you see those latter days, the Akareth, Yom, H319 and 3117, it seems to be prophetic conversation. And so, like I said, the prophecy against Elam is Jeremiah 49, and it seems to be a future yet to be fulfilled scripture talks about the judgment on Elam, like I said, the bow of Elam, my fierce anger, and in the latter days. And so if I had to pick, is it going to be Israel or an earthquake? I'm going to vote earthquake because in this verse, he seems to, saying, seems to be saying, I'm going to do it. And he doesn't seem to be saying, I'm going to use anybody to do it. It just seems like I'm going to do it. So I vote natural earthquake or something by the hand of God. Uh, but who knows? Um, but anyway, the word here it is, latter days, right here. Latter days. The Akarith Yom in Jeremiah 49, 39. What seems to be a, f a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And here's another place that we see uh, Akarith Yom. This is an exciting place to see it as well. And let me first preface it by showing you Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So here we have, um, we're talking about Jacob's trouble, uh, something that's yet to come. And so we expect to see Akareth Yom somewhere in this chapter or somewhere around this. Again, we, we had this other prophecy in Jeremiah 30 
but they shall serve the Lord. And this is uh, Aleph Tav. That's another awesome thing in this verse, Jeremiah 30, verse 9. But they shall serve Aleph Tav, which is Christ, the Lord, their God, and David, their king. But this is not talking about old David. This is talking about David, the son of David, the, Jesus, the son of David, right? Jesus is the son of David in Matthew 1, 1. We know that Jesus actually is he's the son of God, but you know what I mean with the genealogy. Uh, the genealogy of, of Jesus, he comes from the, the line of David. And so Jeremiah 30, verse 7 is talking about Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 9 is talking about a future messianic King David, which is Jesus Christ coming from the line of David. Okay, I would expect to see latter days in this chapter and... Sure enough, we find it right here in the in verse 24. Verse 24, let's make it green to be consistent. Uh, well, did I do that? The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath done it, and until he hath performed it. The intents of his heart in the latter days, in the Akarith Yom, he shall consider it. Jeremiah 20, verse 24, in the same chapter talking about Jacob's trouble, in the same chapter talking about the Messianic um, son of David, David the king, in the same chapter talking, showing the Aleph Tav, which is a, a word that's not translated, it just sits there in Hebrew. And I'll show you, and here it is, and that's Aleph and that's the Tav, that's the beginning and the end. And if you were to say that in Hebrew, you could say, I am the Reshith and the Akareth. I'm the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. So there's another area where you see the Akareth Yom in a very prophetic chapter. Another chapter you find it in, and the last one on my piece of paper here, I think I shared them all, is Jeremiah 23, verse 20. Again, in Jeremiah 23, we have, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David... A righteous branch and a king shall reign. We're talking about Jesus again. We're talking about Jesus coming from the line of David in Jeremiah 23. We're talking about a future fulfillment. And what do we have here in Jeremiah 23, verse 20? The anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, in the latter days, in the Akarith Yom, he shall consider it perfectly. And so... Um, there's one other verse that I, I wanted to share. It doesn't say Akarith Yom, but it's another prophetic verse too, to hammer home this King David point. And that's Ezekiel 34, verse, I think it's like 23 in that area. Let's go find it. Oh yeah, I highlighted it. Okay. Ezekiel 34, 23, 2 through 24. Therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them even, Alatov, my servant David, well, but this is really pointing to Christ, Alatov, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. So isn't that just wonderful, so cool. So yeah, so we have what looks to be a prophecy against uh, Elam, Iran, a future prophetic um, implication in Jeremiah 49, before the, the prophecies of destruction of Babylon. We know that Akarath Yom is a general... When those two Hebrew words are together, usually talking about end times events, you know, rapture, tribulation, millennial reign, second coming stuff. Um, Jesus is going to be coming from the line of David. And um, I'll make another short video on the David thing. I think I, I've already recorded it, probably put it up in a day or two. But just to remind you, David died about a thousand years before the cross, and he died 3,000 years before our expected second coming. We're running out of wiggle room for that to make sense. Like, we're like, we can't really fudge the numbers too much more, you know. So, and his son Solomon started to reign after 
King David died, and that would have been about 3,000 years from our potential second coming. And, and we can't really play with those numbers that much more. Like, we got another year or two, and that's about it. We can't fudge the numbers anymore. You know, you know, all the history books have a certain window of time. We got like maybe two more years to make sense of this King David Solomon thing and, and adding a thousand years to the cross and adding 2,000 years to the second coming. Solomon means peace, and Jesus is going to be the Prince of Peace. So Solomon was a type of Christ in, in that, that his name, in his name it means peace. And Solomon took seven and a half years to build his temple at you know the beginning of his ministry and or his, his reign, not his ministry. And so that all fits. We've also got, um, we don't have much run more, runway space for um, when they entered the Promised Land in 14, that's the thing, in 1408 or or a little bit earlier, 1406, there's not much more runway space for that. We only got about two more years for that to make sense with the second coming, if you count Jubilee cycles. So the Promised Land factor, because they, they crossed the Jordan, and then it took them around seven years to, to actually enter the Promised Land and, and, and divide up the land. So we got about one or two more years to that for that to make sense. We got about one or two more years at best, for the David and Solomon thing to make sense. We got maybe two more years at best for the year of the cross to make sense, for it to be a perfect 2,000 years from the cross. We don't have much more years for it to make sense. And so we're, we're, we're definitely at the end. And um, it is time to get tight with Christ. Now, before I go, is there any questions? I know there's a lot of people here. Any, any questions that you might want to ask before I, I sign off? Um, I'll try and read the comments to the best of my ability. Before you have a question, maybe just type question in cap locks. And maybe something else will come to mind too. I'm sure there's other notes, other things that I wanted to share. But um, yeah, any other questions? When's the rapture? Yeah, I know. I'd love to know when the rapture is, Nicola. Yeah. Lucy, I think, I love the idea that we might be the barley. Yeah, I think that's possible. Barley is, is uh, harvested in the spring. It's harvested around Passover. I love that. Will we see our pets in heaven, David asks. Uh, my answer is, I don't know, but I, what I do know is there are more pets on the ark than there were humans. That's all I got for you. I don't know about the animals. But uh, God is a loving God, and he knows the desires of your heart. So there were more animals on the ark. That's my answer. Uh, a lot of people are, uh, Texas Dream is, yeah, people are looking at May 19th. I don't think it's a significant day on the calendar, May 19th. However, it's a super significant time, seasonal t time to be raptured. So I love the season, April, May, June. Love it a lot. The actual day of May 19th. For me, mm, it's not really anything for me. But I'll be certainly looking up on that day for sure. For sure. I'm 40 years old. Somebody was asking there. Or what year I was born. Um, yeah. Aaron says, what watch dates are you looking for? I love Passover the most, and then I'm just going to go in the order of the feast. As we go, we're just going to look at what we got in front of us and see how would the events are playing out in front of us. So it would be Passover. It would be second Passover. It would be Ascension Day. It would be Pentecost, Ninth of Av. Depending on how you count Pentecost and how it all lines up with Ninth of Av, all that stuff. We'll get there. When we get there, we'll get there if we're there. We'll cross the bridge if we have to. If we're here, Feast of Trumpets, we'll look at that. And we'll just see all the world events that are shaping up. Do I think Jesus knows when? Yep, I think he does. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I don't think Jesus is clueless sitting in the corner uh, counting bricks like my character Enrico does. Question, the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, do we have to wait for on him before the rapture? Uh, I'd say no. And I'd say 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's talking about, if you look at the translation, it's talking about a departure, uh, not necessarily an apostasy. It could actually mean both, but I think it means more if you look at the translation. 
All the translations before 1611 wrote uh, departure, not apostasy. It wasn't until King James came up, which was one of the later versions in 1611, where King James changed it to apostasy. So I think if you go back to the original text, it seems to indicate that it's a departure, which means rapture. And um, But I can go either way on either we knowing the Antichrist or not, so I think it's okay to, to, to guess who it is, if people want to guess. It's possible he's walking around doing his thing, you know, in the background, so it's possible that people might know. Do we see the covenant with many before we rapture? Um, maybe, maybe not. Probably not. We probably won't see it. And keep in mind, it's not, a, it's not a covenant of peace with Israel. It's a covenant with many. So it's good that you, Luan, that you asked covenant with many. It's good that you didn't ask... Uh, about Israel and peace, because that's not what it is. It's not what it says in Daniel 9.27. Yeah, there's a lot of prophecy, Holly, on Ezekiel 38 and 39. That might be why the Lord is leading you to read that. There's lots of study on that. I, Aaron, yeah, I think that Jesus did know when he walked on earth. I, I think he's always known. I, I think what he was just doing is he was using Jewish idioms. Uh, only the Father knows is a Jewish idiom for to say uh, when a groom would go get his bride on a Galilean wedding, only the Father knew when to send the Son. So I think that's the whole point of of that verse. Only the Father knows is, is a wedding uh, term. So um, I think that was the main point of that verse. And I, I need to look more on my my opinions and perspectives on Ezekiel 38 and 39. So I'm not going to say things that I'm not positive about with Ezekiel 38 and 39. I got more studies to do on that. Aaron, love to get your thoughts on the latest Messiah 2030 video. Okay, so uh, Messiah 2030, to my understanding, they are not a rapture group. To my understanding, they are not a seven-year tribulation group. Uh, I am a seven-year guy, and I am a pre-trib guy. So I think what they're probably doing, I didn't watch your video, so I can't really fully comment, but I think what they're doing is they're, to my understanding, based on what I'm hearing from people saying, I think they think that the tribulations, uh, three and a half years, they think that the uh, Jesus fulfilled the first three and a half years in his ministry, and I do not believe that. Uh, if you read Daniel 9, 26, you can see that it, um, we can see a picture of Christ, and then we can see a picture of uh, the Roman Emperor that destroyed the temple in 70 AD. And then you can see it's talking about a future person, not not Christ, uh, in Daniel 9.27. So, um, yeah, that's my short answer there. I, I think they're off with that three and a half thing. I don't think Jesus did the first three and a half years of uh, tribulation. Or it fulfilled three and a half in his ministry. Christine says, what have you said? Okay, so the KJ version changed the, the the translation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, I believe, when it says that there'll be a great... Um, uh, what does it say? This I, I have a new King James here. Uh, it says, is it, does it say the apostasy? Falling away. That's that's the, that's the term. It's a, it's, it's a falling away, and uh, but really it should say departure. All the original text said departure. Yeah, there's some other things about the King James too that they'll say meat offerings in the Old Testament or corn offerings in the Old Testament when really, um, instead of meat, they really should say grain offerings. So there's a couple times in the King James world they'll they'll change the the text too. So just any translation you read, just double check with the Hebrew and the Greek and verify it. And um, yeah, don't get stuck on any translation. Study everything and make sure if you're gonna if you're gonna really be gung ho about a translation, be really gung ho about Hebrew because that's what the Old Testament was written in. I do I don't know about the Psalm 83 war yet, Aaron, but I I do think that uh, it's going to be quick. Everything's going to be moved quick on God's prophetic prophetic seven thousand year plan, but I think it's going to 
from a day to day perspective, I think this is still going to be a slow thing. I think God's going to give more time for people to get saved, and so I think we're going to see. I think we're going to see a lot of banter in the next couple of weeks between Israel and Iran and U.S. and lots of banter, lots of talk. I think we're going to see that next couple of days and weeks, as long as we're here. Yes, Randy, I think it's a covenant with many for seven years. Yes. Do you think the Jerusalem Temple will be targeted in the near near future? I'm a little bit curious about how that's all going to play out. I think the Dome of the Rock is more substantial than we realize. Uh, I've talked about that in the past, so I won't spend too much time on that topic. But the Dome of the Rock, the rock that it covers, seems to be the rock that is where it uh, held the Ark of the Covenant. And so uh, I think the Dome of the Rock is more special in eschatology than, than most people give credit to it. So we'll leave it there. I think Islam is a really big deal. I think the Antichrist will write on the Islamic system. Questions. Do you think the Holy Spirit in all believers is restraining God's judgment until we are raptured? I think a very simple answer would be, yeah, I, I think so. I think the Holy Spirit is restraining a lot of things. Yeah, I think so. Does the falling away disapprove once they've always... It has nothing to do with the the once they've always saved stuff, uh, Holly. The falling away. The Greek word, if my if my memory serves me correct, is apostasia, which means a departure. Uh, well, the original would say departure, but the King James would say falling away. So, oh, I, I see what you're saying with the once save. Okay, because of the falling away falling away from the faith. Okay, yeah, I get where you're going with that. Um, no, I don't... I think it was just a translation. Uh, not not the best choice, and I think it really meant to say departure in terms of rapture. Because the whole book is talking about the rapture. Really, the whole book of First Thess uh, First and Second Thessalonians, is they're talking about the rapture, the whole book. And they're really, they're saying, Paul, did we miss the rapture? And like, no, no, guys, calm down. Let me tell you how that's going to go there's going to be this great departure and then you're going to see the man of sin and this is how it's all going to play out and he's going to set up, he's going to stand in the temple and all this kind of stuff. So the whole book is about um, the rapture. That's the context of it. So, I don't know how strong the Iron Dome is, but it seems pretty impressive. They they pretty they did pretty pretty good there with the Iron Dome. So I don't know how that's all going to play out. Yeah, it sure does feel like the rapture soon. Why does it say pray that your flight is not in winter? Uh, you if you want if you just showed up, I would recommend that you go back. I talked about that for about ten minutes about the halfway point. I think Matthew twenty four verse fifteen through um, whatever it is twenty. Is talking with the halfway point, the abomination of desolation, and midway point. So we got Hanukkah, po possibly abomination of desolation, Sabbath day, winter, could be Hanukkah. Midpoint could be December 25th, 2027. You minus 1260 days. That gets you to the summer of this year. Hopefully a rapture before today and the summer. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Uh, I wish I understood your question, the Great Commission. Um, how is there a rapture when the Messiah returns in tabernacles with his people for a thousand years? Because uh, the Bible says so. There's seven years of tribulation before the millennial kingdom. We're not appointed for wrath. Um, I don't know when the heifer sacrifices are going to be. What time is it in Canada? I am EST time. It's 11.06 over here. Okay, so Jane, question. Do you think this war will take the Dome of the Rock down so the temple can be built? So my view, I'm a little bit different in my view. I think that the Dome of the Rock will likely be the location 
of the abomination of desolation. So I'm not quite sure if I, in my opinion, that we're going to see the Dome of the Rock taken down. I don't know, though. I'm very, very open to changing. I don't even, I don't have a solid, solid, solid belief on this, but I think the Dome of the Rock is a very special timepiece in eschatology, and I think it's going to be protected. And I think the Antichrist is probably going to, he might set, set up his abomination of desolation at the Dome of the Rock. We'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Maybe they'll build a temple beside it. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure how that's going to go. Yeah, Nancy says, question, is the midpoint in the spring or the fall? I love the midpoint at Hanukkah. My second favorite would be the midpoint at Passover, making the trip start in the fall. Yeah, I haven't been following any heifer news. Is there any heifer news? Not sure, but uh, that those heifers will expire soon. Like this, I don't think they'll wait longer than a year. So that's what I mean. All these other timelines that I talked about, King David dying about 3,000 years ago from the second coming, um, them going over the promised land at latest, latest 1406, this heifer, they got about another year. Like everything's, there's so many things. There's just so many things lining up right now for everything that just happened. Do you think having a, an obsession with eschatology is a gift? I don't know, but I would say I would say the word balance. I think the word balance is such an important word right now. So I would say it's so important to study the Bible and figure this stuff out. Make sure you're super balanced with it all. Make sure you're balanced. You still got to do stuff. You still got to pay your bills. Still got to take care of the kids. Still got to take out the trash. Still got to wash the dishes. Uh, make sure you're balanced when you're doing all your studies. Okay. I know some of you might think the rapture is in two days, and that's awesome. Still make plans for three days from now. Okay. Too many people let down when they like I love rapture dates. I love it. I love looking at them, but oh you gotta be you gotta be balanced. You can't put your all your eggs in a basket, that's for sure. Yeah, just reading your comments here as we go. Yeah, if you go back, uh, Swift Bear, I at the beginning of this video or 20 minutes in or something, I was talking about the fig tree generation and my a proposed guess, if you will. I it's you asking me a question about the fig tree, and I'm asking a question to everybody else. I was thinking, could we apply the fig tree generation to the midway point? And um, I don't know. That's my question of the day. So if go back to maybe the twenty minute mark or something in the video and you can you can see there. Question, what do you think about the Rock Island books? Yeah, I think he's great. Same thing. Remember, we're all speculating. Okay, so he's convinced that Jesus died in thirty AD. He's convinced that the tribulation will start by the fall. He's selling books and DVDs. Same thing, guys. We're all guessing and speculating just because he's got an awesome presentation, which he does could be here next year so we don't know we don't know so i think it's awesome i'm i'm just trying to rack my brain brain with everything like i'm trying to think about the, the big timeline i'm just re going back going back to my charts that i presented last year and recalibrating and being open-minded like is it possible that jesus died in 31 ad i guess so is it possible he died in 32 ad i guess so you know um what does that mean how do we handle this year zero thing? I'm re I'm rethinking that. How do we handle that? And uh, does that do we need to adjust a year here or there? Um, either way you slice it, though. Like I said, there, you just we just there's a maximum here, a window of like maybe two years, like before everything unravels in terms of understanding. I think you're about right. Strike fire for the true new sun date. It's around April. I don't think. 26 maybe something like that
Oh, d Israel is attacking Iran in 48 minutes. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Holly Paolo, thank you for letting us know. Israel is attacking Iran in 48 minutes. We'll have to find out what they're actually doing. Yeah, Bob, I answered that question earlier. I think that May 18th, 19th, certainly a great season, but I don't think it's um, Pentecost. So I don't think it's a big, um, I don't think it's a big day there. Barbara says she agrees with me 85% of the time. Well, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I don't agree with everybody all the time either. So that that's that's perfect. I think it's healthy to not agree with everything that somebody says and still have a share the love of Christ with people and to agree to disagree on certain things and um, still have fellowship. Really, we're all just Jesus loving people that want to be with our Savior. Uh, Bonnie Yard says, no pre-trib rapture, guys. Sorry, but we must endure. I know that's not a question, but, um, you know, um, there, the story of escape is everywhere in the Bible. And people will say, where's the rapture? The rapture isn't in the Bible. Well, uh, in the book of Daniel, Daniel was brought to a high place of um, leadership. And it was his three buds that went to the furnace. It, Daniel wasn't there. He was he was not there. And same thing with, so Dan, there's a type and shadow of the rapture right there. The book of um, Genesis, Joseph, who was brought to jail, and he was brought to second in command. There's a picture of the rapture right there. And then his brothers came and saw him later. In, in the in the book of Genesis and and Exodus. Well, I guess it would be uh, it would be Genesis, yeah. So um, this, there is the picture of the rapture right there. Joseph was brought up to uh, second in command, uh, the right hand of Pharaoh in a way, just like Jesus is brought to the right hand of God. And then Israel will eventually come to Jesus and say, Ah, oh, we betrayed you. You are the Son of God. His brother said, Oh man, we did betray you. Please forgive us. Joseph's like, Don't worry about it. I, it was all meant to happen. There's your rapture right there. So the rapture's there in Genesis. The rapture's uh, in Exodus. How many people took off out of Exodus? All those slaves, they came out of Passover. There was an escape. There's your third spot. So we got a rapture in Genesis. Joseph was um, uh, brought to a high power. We got a rapture in Exodus in Passover. Um, okay, let's go to the next book. Where's the next book? We got in Leviticus chapter 8. We have a rapture in Leviticus chapter 8. Why? Because um, in Revelation 1, it says that the churches are uh, priests. And in Leviticus chapter 8, a priest has to be consecrated for seven days. And so uh, in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 30 through 33, you got to be consecrated for seven days. That's uh, There's your type and shadow of a seven-year seven year, um, consecration. we got to be upstairs being consecrated for seven days. There's your fourth proof. Your, your, your fifth proof. Jesus died on the cross. Where'd he go? They're, we're standing there like, where'd he go? Well, on Ascension Day, right? Where, where'd he go? Two angels there saying, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. He's, he's going to come back in the same way. But you know what? Uh, it was only the people that were close to Christ that were able to witness him flying in the sky. It wasn't everybody else. It was a select group that was able to witness him. And the angel said, don't worry. He's coming back in the same way. Um. I could do this for a while. There's there's so much typology all over the place of uh, rapture hidden everywhere in the text. So there you go. And you got to think wedding -y too. And you got to understand the Galilean culture. You got to think like a wedding. Uh, the Talmud. Uh, I don't know much about the Talmud, TNT, but I do know the Quran is complete opposite of Christianity. 
like when it comes to eschatology, they think that the Mahdi is going to rule for seven years and they're going to behead people if they're not Muslim. It's exactly the opposite of what Christianity is. So I've done some videos in the past on that. Uh, Hannah says, there is no preacher of rapture. It's a Jesuit lie. I wish it were true, but it's not. Uh, be prepared to go through the tribulation. Okay. Yeah, I just answered some of that stuff earlier on. Um, before people say just prove it and show me a rapture verse, like I would suggest first reading the whole Bible, step one. And step two, I would uh, try to understand the heart of God and the heart of Christ. Like understand that there's a, so much wedding imagery in the Bible and he's he's even calls himself the bridegroom, right? The, the, and then at the end of the revelation, the, the bride and the spirit say come, the spirit and the bride say come. And in Matthew 22, there's a parable about a wedding and, um, and it's the foolish virgins and it's, it's so much wedding imagery everywhere. It's everywhere. Only the Father knows is is a wedding invitation, and so it's kind of like I joke about this in the past, but it's like you know you're gonna beat your bride be, be, before you you marry her. Like it makes no sense. You got to prove yourself. No, no, Jesus already proved himself. Jesus already proved himself. We don't got to prove ourselves. We say yes, Lord, yes, I do, and He covers us. That's what He does. That's what he does. Thanks for partying with me, guys. You guys are awesome. Love you guys very much. Oh, she's just copying and pasting it. Okay. Well, I love you. I pray... Lord, I pray for everybody here. I pray they come to full understanding about eschatology. I guess nobody really fully will. But Lord, I pray that you just work in everybody's hearts. And I pray that you show your heart to everybody. In the story of the rapture and the end times events. Amen. You know, in Thessalonians, it talks about the rapture. And and then it does this. I'll read, I'll read the verse here. It says... Uh, uh, after talking about the rapture, here I'll read First Thessalonians chapter one verse ten. Um, to wait for His Son, whom heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay, so First Thessalonians one verse ten says that Jesus will deliver us from the wrath to come, and so they're talking about the rapture, and. Um, it says here in 4.16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So it's not, therefore, terrify with each other with these words and tell everybody that they got to prove themselves and get through the tribulation. No, that's not what it says in First Thessalonians 4.18. It doesn't say prove yourself. It says comfort yourself because you're going to meet him in the air. And another thing, too, is Revelation 14. Uh, we see a reaping. Okay, so this is Revelation 14. Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one, like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, one golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, so I think that's a, one of the pictures of the rapture in Revelation 14, verse 14 through 16. One golden crown. One golden crown. One golden crown in Revelation 14, which is a picture of the rapture. Let's read the second coming stuff. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
So at the second coming, Jesus is going to have many crowns, many crowns, many crowns, that says, more than one. He's going to have many crowns at the second coming. At, at the rapture, he's going to have one golden crown and a sickle. Revelation 14, 14 through 16, he's got one crown and a sickle. Revelation 19, there's no sickle. Mm -mm -mm. No sickle. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No sickle, as James would say. Mm -mm. No. Nope. Oh, you think you're going to make it through tribulation? No. No. No, no. Um, so he comes with, uh, not a sickle, he comes with many crowns. What, what does he come with? He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. They ain't no sickle this time. There's a sharp soul coming. Okay? Revelation 19, verse 15. That with it he should strike the nations. Uh-oh. Strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. So in Revelation 19, he's got a sword. Uh-oh. And a many crowns. Uh-oh. Revelation 14, he got one crown. And he got a sickle. He ain't got no sword in Revelation 14. He ain't got no sword. He got a sickle. Okay, you got a sickle in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, you got a sickle in one crown. Revelation 19, you got a sword in many crowns. We got a different event going on here, folks. We got a different event. One crown and a sickle. A bunch of crowns and a sword. Different scene. Different event. There you go. Um, and of course, we got, we've got uh, the lampstands. We can talk about the lampstands a while, too. We got lampstands. We got to talk about the lampstands. But here, I'll get back to the questions here. Just trying to catch up here. Yeah, for God has not appointed us to wrath, Lee Jones. Yep, just just skimming quick here, trying to read your stuff. Uh huh. Yep. What comfort is there in going to the trib? I know, if you even make it to the end, if you even make it. Yeah, Hannah. Good question. What about all these people dying? Okay, so um, again, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about them. When our time comes, it's, it's time to come. If Jesus, if we have to die for our faith now, that's what we got to do. What we got to do. But in the story of Exodus, for example, Hannah, when um, you know they were in slavery for hundreds of years, right? And Dad was a slave, and the granddad was a slave, and the great great grandfather was a slave, and the great grandfather and the great great they had so many people that were slave, 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 slave. Some then one day, some guy named Moses and Aaron show up. Hey guys, uh, we're time to leave, and they're like, you know what? My dad died. My dad, dad died. All these other people are dying around me. We're all slaves. We're all going to die. Nobody's getting out of here. That's it. Yeah, so what about, well, yeah, what about the other people that are dying? And Moses and Aaron would say to that guy in Israel, uh, the slaves, and say, it's not about you. It's about God's timing. When God says it's time to go, you go. When God says it's time for the tribulation to start, it's going to start. When God says it's time to snatch and us out with one sickle in Revelation 14 and not bring the sword the first time, but bring the sickle for the harvest, when God wants the harvest, God's going to do the harvest. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about our Father, Yeshua. Yeshua. When he says it's time, it's time. Not about you. There are lots of really horrible things going on, but that doesn't mean a God's story doesn't change. Okay, God's story doesn't change. It is bad. What's going on? <laughs> 
Uh, J James is a fun guy. James Smith. He, he can go off, man. He can go off for a while. He, he, one of the funny things, he's like, oh, you think you're going to get ready for the tribulation? Oh, you think you're going to just like get some water bottles and some crackers and some Mr. Noodle for the tribulation? You think you're going to get ready for God's wrath? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. You think you're going to get make it through the tribulation? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he's funny, but he can go off for like eight minutes in, in a study video. Um, no, I don't. I don't believe that Jesus cut off the middle of the week in the Daniel nine. I do not think that. I don't think that's a thing. I guess. I mean, we could talk about that. I guess if we, if you guys want, I'll just check other questions beforehand. Uh, okay, you know what? Let's do the Daniel 9 thing. The Daniel 9, people are asking about Daniel 9 and three and a half weeks and all that stuff. This is one of those things that people are super, super opinionated on something. So if, if you are one of those pr people that already think that you know what this is and you don't want to be open to it, you're not going to hear what I'm saying. So, but if you have a heart of, hey, I want to learn something, well, you know, hey, have a listen. But I don't just, I encourage you to try and be open minded about what I'm saying here. And you be the judge, and it's okay. I love you if we have different views. I know there's lots of views out there. There's people out there that are talking about three and a half years and all this, and I'll try my best to explain it shortly. Daniel 9, 24. Um, 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in the everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's Jesus. Okay. So, no, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that was around 457 B.C. with the Ezra, the decree given to Ezra, and to the Messiah, the Prince, that's Jesus, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall built, be built again in the wall, even in troubled times. So, it's, it gave you a count of 62 weeks and then it gave you a count of um, seven weeks. All right. So, there was another gap between, there was a decree given to Ezra first, and there was a de decree given to Nehemiah, and there was a almost perfect gap between those two decrees. So that covers the that seven-week gap, and then there's 62 weeks after that. So after the 69 weeks, okay, so after the three score and two weeks, so after the 62 weeks, after the 69 weeks, not 69 and a half weeks, all right, here, let me read a different version, maybe. Um, let me see if, uh, let me see if uh, we can do this. Okay, just, just so people understand this a bit more. Um, after 62 weeks, so there's 62, and um, there's their seven, okay? Make it a bit easier and clearer for you to see that. So we got uh, we got seven weeks here and sixty two weeks. Not sixty two and a half weeks. After the sixty two weeks, okay. Well, there you go. I mean that that's it right there. Sixty two plus seven, sixty nine. An anointed one shall be cut off. Okay, so that's uh, that's Jesus. And then the people of the prince. This is a different guy right here. This is the guy that destroyed the temple in seventy A.D. Okay, so it's pretty clear. That we have a seven week, so we got, before the seven was a, dec a decree given to Ezra, after the seven weeks was a decree given to Nehemiah, 62 weeks from Nehemiah brought you to when Jesus died on the cross, the anointed one, and he was cut off, Jesus was cut off, okay, that's Jesus there, and then, period, and then the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city, that happened in 70 AD, that was a 70 AD thing. And then after the 70 AD thing, we have some other guy that's going to make a strong covenant with many. That would be the Antichrist. So that is how I see it. I just went over to this other version so you can see it in plain English. The other version has, it's harder to understand how this all works. 
Now, if this Dandelion 26 said after 62 and a half weeks, okay, then maybe maybe I would consider that this three and a half thing by Jesus. But Jesus did not fill, fulfill the first three and a half years. Also, Jesus will not make a strong covenant with many for one week and then after the halfway point put an end to sacrifice and offering. Uh, remember, too, there's going to be sacrifice and offering in the millennial kingdom, too. You know, so this is not talking about Christ in that way too, because of that whole thing. There, there's that to to consider too. But uh, also know that Daniel nine is sandwiched by Daniel eight and is also sandwiched by Daniel eleven. Daniel eight and eleven is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes who set up an abomination of desolation at the halfway point after running their temple for a couple of years, and then the Jews going to the wilderness for about three years. The time of Antiochus Epiphanes was almost a perfect blueprint of seven years. It was like six years or so he was a perfect blueprint of what was to come and daniel 9 27 is sandwiched by the guy that took over the jews for almost seven years so i think the reason why jesus did three and a half years was he was fulfilling uh the pro he was basically following in the steps of whoops um where am i here um did i lose myself okay let's go back here I think what was going on here is, um, uh, okay, I'm back, was that Daniel was, um, Daniel 9.27 was sandwiched by 8 and 11, which was Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, Daniel 9, seven, uh, seven years. Antiochus Epiphanes basically did a seven-year thing with the Jews. You can read about all that in the first book of Maccabees, chapter 1, if you want to. Um. Elijah's ministry was three and a half years. So too, the two witnesses' ministry will be three and a half years. And so there was three and a half years before the sin event. Uh, there'll be three and a half years. It looks to me the best place to put the witnesses are at the beginning of the seven years. Um, and Jesus was doing a three and a half year ministry as well. We are not in the first three and a half years. The two tribute, the two witnesses, will be holding back rain and fire. And all sorts of crazy things. It says that in Revelation 11. Um, the two witnesses are not just walking around in a, at a campsite doing nothing right now. Most people that have any other belief from a seven-year tribulation or believe that the rapture is at the midpoint, everybody I ask, they don't know what to do with, with the two witnesses. They are just like, I don't know what to say about those guys. Or they give you an answer that's like, ooh, that's not a good answer. Like one answer... Somebody said, "Oh yeah, they're just they're just quiet. They're just camping right now, and they're not doing. They're not public. They've been around for about three years, and they're, they're not public. Like, what do you mean they're not public? The two witnesses are not witnessing. They're just camping, and they're not talking to anybody. They're on Earth, but they're what? No, that's not that doesn't make any sense. And it wouldn't make any sense to put the witnesses in the last three and a half because their whole job is to tell people about Christ. It's the final warning." So it makes perfectly logical sense to put them at the beginning of the seven years. They warn, they tell everybody about Christ. And the angels help them as well by flying around in Revelation 14 and, um, and telling people, hey, Babylon's fallen, don't get the mark, and on all that. And the angel warning is in 14, 6 through 12, more or less. Um, Judgment has come, Babylon has fallen, and don't get the mark of the beast, and don't worship the mark of the beast, or the, or the, don't worship the beast. And the warning is sent out, the two witnesses are doing their thing, they're blowing fire out of their mouth. Like, I mean, the witnesses aren't here, they're blowing fire out of their mouth, and there's no rain for 42 months. Come on, guys, did it rain in the last couple days? Yeah, it did. Okay, they're not here. They're not here. They're not here, okay? All right. Um, all right, this live has been long enough, I suppose. Guys, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for talking about all this kind of stuff. Love you very much. Most important, get tight with Christ. Enter into relationship with Jesus. Agree to disagree on things. Be teachable. Try your hardest to really, like change your opinion on something. If the truth comes, you want to be prepared to receive the truth. Be teachable. I try my best so hard. When somebody brings a new idea, I'm like, okay, just tell me your idea. Let's, let's see if it checks out. 
I, tr I try my best. And it's very hard to put yourself in that situation of being teachable. So remain teachable. Uh, be willing to change your mind. Jesus is coming either way you slice the cake. He just is. And I don't know the day, but we're running out of the runway space for sure. Get tight with Christ. Go, Jesus, go. I hope to see you in the clouds very soon. And we'll talk soon. Okay, love you.